It's a pleasure to have Steve Vossett as our speaker today uh, for Bar Shop Seminar Series. Well, I, a, Holly said it just okay. So uh, Dr. Richardson was supposed to introduce Steve, but about two hours ago Stella told me that he wouldn't be able to come and sent me Steve's CV to introduce him. So over the last couple of hours I've been trying to come up with what I would say. And I figured that um, since we all pretty much know Steve and uh, know he's been a, you know, a leader in aging research for a while now. Um, and then I got the CV and it was 24 pages jammed full of awards and stuff and I didn't even know where to start. So um, I just figured that I would sort of give you my anecdote to my, my introduction to Steve. And it started, well, it wasn't even, I didn't even actually meet him. So I started doing master's research, had no idea what I wanted to do. I was working in a fly lab that, that worked, one of the projects was on aging. And at the time, I had no idea about what aging was. Or, well, I mean, I knew what aging was, but not about the research of aging. And so I went to the library to get a book. And there were three books there. One was Tuck Finch's um, Longevity, Senescence, and the Genome. One was the Handbook of the Biology of Aging, and one was Steve's Why We Age. And so those first two books are 900 pages and... 600 pages, and Steve's was like 250 pages, so I, I read it. And it's small pages. It, it's a very, very quick read, but, but a very good read. I mean, it really sort of spelled out, you know, what we knew at the time about aging research, what we didn't know, and I think really sort of stimulated my interest in following up on aging research. So I think in, in many ways, Steve played a big role in, in what I decided to follow up and do aging research, and and in turn is the reason why I'm here introducing him today. So it's, it's a pleasure to, uh, to have Steve give his talk today on the evolutionary uh, perspective on dietary restriction. Thanks, Adam. I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. Um, I thought I'd, do, I'd give an idea talk today, an idea and a, and a kind of historical talk, because one of the notable things about San Antonio of course, is that it, it really made its reputation and got famous uh, for the study of dietary restriction in aging. And so where better to give a talk where I sort of challenge some of the prevailing orthodoxies of dietary restrictions interpretation. One of the hazards of growing old, as Arlen Richardson could testify, is that one tends to get trapped in one's own uh, personal stereotypes and, one, and one's thinking tends to fall into the same sorts of grooves. And I think that that can happen to research paradigms as well. And so I think it, 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 it's a good time. The oldest research paradigm really in aging is the, is the dietary restriction paradigm. So I think it's time to take a fresh look at it and in the hopes by uh, stretching it in new directions that we may actually uh, come up with some new insights. So let me just start with what everybody knows or thinks they know, which is that Clive McKay really uh, uncovered uh, the phenomenon of dietary restriction in the 1930s, noting its effect uh, on survival. And he wasn't really interested in uh, survival or longevity when he started his studies. He was interested in growth, in growth restrictions. And I must mention that he did this all at uh, Cornell in the veterinary school in the 1930s. But in fact, uh, McKay was only following on a a long tradition, oh, I'll get back to that. A long tradition of people talking about how reducing one's caloric intake um, could increase the quality and the length of life. And the earliest incidents of this that I know is the Italian Luigi Cornero, who are in the uh, 16th century, wrote a book, The Art of Living Long, in which he extolled the virtues, the health benefits of dietary restriction. Now. Uh, Cornero's book went through four printings, and it became a wild bestseller in northern Italy in the 16th century, part of which of the reason was because if you look at his birth and death dates here, you'll see that he lived to be 109, which was not too bad for those days. But of course, for those of us who have been in the aging business for any length of time, we realize uh, that you have to take a lot of things in the field with a grain of salt. And so here's what uh, Carnero had to say, that whoever wishes to eat much must eat little, which means simply that eating of a little lengthens a man's life, and by living a long time, he is enabled to eat a great deal. So Carnero was very ill 
early in his life. He went on an extreme caloric restriction diet and over the next course of the next 100 years or so uh, wrote a series of books. Uh, but did he? In fact, uh, like many things, like many uh, legends of human longevity, when it was finally investigated in detail, it turns out that Carnero wasn't really uh, quite as old. In fact, each edition of his book, if one looks carefully, his birth date gets earlier and earlier and earlier. Still, he lived to be 83 years in the 16th century, uh, and that's not bad. Now, besides the fact that, that caloric restriction lengthens life, I think, I think that what's gotten people's attention over the years so dramatically as, is the manifold impacts that it has on, uh, on health. So it really just isn't the length of life that counts. And here's a good example from, from this institution, uh, from Roger McCarter, where he actually measured uh, running activity in, in uh, rats of various ages, spontaneous running activity. Now, I've always wondered, where the hell are these guys going? I mean, what are you getting on a wheel and running? It's, it proves you can get on a wheel and run, but it also proves that you're a little bit Stupid, because where are you running? You're running around in circles for hours after hours. Now, I think to understand where I think we've missed the big story in caloric restriction, because that's going to be the main idea of my talk, is that we've missed a major aspect of, a, of, of dietary restriction. And we've missed it because of the historical way that the field developed. But the thing that we missed, I think, has enormous clinical implications, and that's, that's really what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the time. Now, one of the reasons I think that we miss this is because of the early questions that were asked about the effects. One of the key questions was that does dietary restriction work? Does it have these wonderful beneficial effects because it reduces metabolic rate? And the people here, starting with Ed Masro and then Roger McCarter, I think demonstrated beyond question that this is not the fact. But if you'll notice uh, the, the, the graph right here, you'll notice that early on after dietary restriction, in fact, there is a suppression of metabolic rate. And it takes several months for that suppression to really creep back up so that one is getting the same rate of metabolism uh, per gram of lean body mass. And I think showing that sort of focused the attention on, on chronic caloric restriction, because in order to see the whole system equilibrate, one had to wait months. And that's where I think that we really have been missing uh, one of the big stories. The other question that was asked again and again and again was, how late can you start this? It, you know, we realized even, you know, 30, 40 years ago that 20-year-olds are not likely to be doing anything to enhance their long-term health. And so we always wanted to know how late could you start this uh, and get an effect. And the standard uh, paradigm was that you started dietary restriction after weaning, soon after weaning. But then people started to push that back. And in the 1980s, Weindrick and Walford published this paper where for two genotypes uh, of mice, they demonstrated that if you started dietary restriction at a year of age, you still got a substantial survival effect. But the fact that they were looking at things in terms of survival, and we tend to still look at things in the mammalian aging litter in terms of survival, instead of in terms of age-specific mortality, which tells you something about short-term effects, again, focused our attention on, on the long-term, on chronic restriction. Steve Spindler's group pushed it back even farther showing that if you started, at least in this genotype uh, of mouse, that if you started as late as 19 months of age, that you still got a substantial increase in longevity. So those were the nature of the questions that were being asked. And you'll notice in each of these slides, what I've got across the top there is chronic DR, because that's really where the focus was. At what age can you start, stay on DR the rest of your life, and how does that affect aging? Here's one of the few papers that I found where really tried a series of stand. The other thing, let me mention about this, because there was a whole other uh, issue in the field, which is do you feed your control animals ad lib, or do you feed them to keep them from getting obese? 
In this study that I'm showing right here, the control animals were restricted by about 10%. This was, this was a paradigm that was invented by Roy Walford, and I think there's some reasonable justification for using that paradigm, which is that if you restrict to 10%, all your animals are eating the same amount. When you're feeding ad lib, that ad lib amount uh, can vary. So I think there's an argument to be made that that's a pretty reasonable way to approach it. But then if you restrict from there, it's not the same as restricting from the ad lib paradigm. So here's one of the first studies in, in, in which uh, Weindrick and Walford really did a succession of extreme, extreme restrictions where you can see you get a dramatic, a pretty dramatic effect with a 24% restriction. You get an even more dramatic effect with 45%. And there's even additional longevity squeezed out of the system if the mice were restricted by 65%. That is, they're eating about one-third of, of the ad lib diet in this case. Now, is that something, nobody would, I have never found another study that is restricted to that extent. In fact, I asked Weindrick, I said, did you try even more restriction? He goes, of course I tried more restriction. They all died. I mean, you know, get, when I got to 30, you know, 66 percent restriction, they all died. But right there on the threshold of, of death, they were living uh, longer than ever. No, that is not a mouse strain that anybody else has ever, has ever worked with, and I don't know why they chose it. Perhaps Dr. Masro knows why they chose it, but I certainly do. It's a long live strain. It may have been that they were just look, looking for a long live strain, but that's not standard. Yes, Salvo. So by taking the flex polymer, the threshold of death, what right. the disease actually is the mice that are Well, they didn't. They they didn't. They didn't. They necropsy them, but they didn't do any kind of health assessments. But the, I mean, if you look at the longevities there, they're really they're really pretty incredible. I mean, the oldest ones are living over four years, so this is this is really pretty substantial. It's not like you're taking a short live control strain and extending it. These are pretty long lived even at the control. Jim, go ahead. I, I, I guess I want to make a couple of comments here because. Basically, the, you have the problem that, that you have to, oh, I'm sorry, that you can't mix mice and rats. And uh, why I say that is that, indeed, there was a lot of early work uh, done by Ross showing that if, if you restricted animals, rats, and they only use rats if they, for uh, a very great amount, you'd get a very long life subgroup in it, but most of them would die. So that the idea that you don't get early deaths in the rats is not true. Uh, and the other, other thing uh, with rats is that basically, there, I've never seen a rat study where they ever got extension of life after 12 months of age. Uh, while with the mouse, you get it up to, up to 19 months of age. Right. So they, they're very different. And then if you ask the question, what about uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Gompertz analysis? Well, the rats show a beautiful Gompertz analysis that indicates that uh, aging is slow. That's not true of the mouse. It just sets the initial rate. So you, I think that mixing rats and mice is impossible. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point, Ed, because I think we tend to think of them you know, most people think of them as pretty much one is a bigger version of the other. But absolutely, they're, they're very different. They're, different. they're different in many ways, from behavior to physio, all kinds of ways. And one of the things that I think we've done ourselves a disservice is by pretending that this is a single phenomenon in all of the genotypes and all of the species that we've, that we've looked at. I, I don't think it is. I, I absolutely agree with you. Well, one of the things is that even... Even across, uh, uh, so from mice to rats, do you get the same thing? Here's a study that, that uh, came out of this group as well. It's never been published, but here basically it was a 10% restriction versus a 40% restriction. And you can see in this case, the 10% restriction got just about as much longevity enhancement as the 40% uh, restriction. Now, some of this may be the rat versus mouse, but some of it may just be the genotype of mouse versus the genotype of rat. 
There was another study that looked at the same thing, and in this case, we didn't get complete survival curves, but we got the percent that were alive uh, basically at two years of age. And you can see, like in the previous study, a 10% restriction got just about as much of a life extension as a 40% restriction. Now, this actually has some implication because any of us could imagine, none of us could imagine restricting our diets 40%. But many of us, not me, many of you may uh, be able to restrict your uh, diet 10% if you thought, and this is an important if, that it was going to enhance the quality and the length of your life, which Steve? is still a big open question. Steve. Steve. The other thing, the other question historically has been, does, does, does it work in all species? And I think the prevailing wisdom has been that, yes, it works. And by works, what I mean is, that uh, it extends life and enhances health in virtually all species. And here are some of the species in which it's been reported to work like that. The only one of these that I really would take to the bank is the spider one right here, since that was my first bit of research in, uh, caloric, in, in aging research myself. So, and the, then the other key question is, does DR work in humans? And there are ongoing studies that I think have virtually nothing to do with the dietary restriction paradigms that have been studied uh, so long in rodents. But just parenthetically, if you want to have some idea of what phenotypically you might look like after you'd undergone the kind of severe caloric restriction, this is Roy Walford sort of before and after. Actually, it's, it's, it's during and after. This is not a picture of him before he went into the biosphere. It's a picture of him when he came out and started eating again versus what he looked like. There's a great sociological experiment in here, by the way. For those of you who don't remember the biosphere, too, it was this sort of theatrical uh, two-year experience where people were sealed up in this artificial environment with the idea it would be self-sustaining. Uh, and uh, it, it didn't work out so well on a variety of, of reasons. But one of the things that happened is when they came out, these, these, these eight people hated each other uh, in a deathly fashion. And so Roy had this wonderful picture of all of them sort of spread eagled naked when they went in, and then again just before they came out. And for my book, I asked him if I could use that, uh, use it. And he said, I'd, I'd love to let you uh, use it, Steve. But um, everything's in litigation now. Everybody's suing everybody else, and so we can't allow this. <laughs> So now let me step back. So that's sort of w what we know. Um, let me step back now and take a kind of zoological evolutionary perspective. Uh, for one thing, you know, laboratory rodents are very strange. I think of them as kind of like I think of, of this pug compared to this wolf. Um, they are uh, bigger, faster growing, and more fecund than what I'll call for the sake of a better term, real mice, that is mice uh, that are living in nature or have recently lived in nature. They are dumber, slower, oblivious to social cues, hormonally aberrant. Russ Ryder's not here, but I guess uh, uh, he would be interested, in, well, he would know very well that most laboratory strains produce no melatonin in their pineal gland for reasons we don't understand. Laboratory mice have dramatically longer telomeres uh, than wild mice. So we're really not talking about uh, a phenotype that has necessarily been shaped by evolution and natural selection because there's been so much evolution of the laboratory mouse in the genotype. And are they gluttonous? This seems to me to be a, a key point because for many years, the people who really did not like the dietary restriction paradigm made the claim and I haven't been able to get them to, 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 to uh, uh, rescind this claim in spite of lots of evidence, that what you're really comparing was a gluttonous animal that had been selected to eat a lot so it could grow fast and make a lot of babies in the laboratory. And you were comparing it, in a sense, to the restricted one, which was really eating about the healthy, the healthy amount that an animal in nature would eat. So I think a key question as we start now to think about dietary restriction, not as a purely laboratory phenomenon, but as maybe telling us something about the way that evolution has molded the physiology of rodents, the key question is, is it simply the prevention of overeating? And uh, Debbie Christon, a postdoc in my lab for a, while, uh, for a while, and I 
worked on this a lot. And one of the things that we did was we, we noticed that certainly laboratory rodents are a lot fatter uh, than wild rodents. This is uh, percent body fat from animals that we caught in the wild. These are mice that we caught in the wild versus laboratory mice. And these are actually pretty lean laboratory mice because one of the things that we had to do was we had to control for age. And as I'll show you in a little while, mice in the field do not live long enough for a lot of the uh, phenot for not a lot of the so-called benefits of dietary restriction to kick in. But we also looked at some field mice that have been raised in the laboratory for several generations. So these guys have had access to all of the same food that these guys have, and they still don't have nearly the percent body fat. So there is some evidence that laboratory animals have been selected to eat more than uh, field animals. Now, it turns out that there was actually some information that we could get out of the literature on how much mice in nature ate. And if you look at the absolute values, it turns out that, oops, this is, this is a typo. This should be lab. So this should be animals in the lab do eat about twice as much as wild animals in the lab or wild animals in the wild. But there's a huge confound here. The huge confound is that the laboratory animals are much, much larger. And if you correct for body size, and then you ask, uh, what's the food, food intake? You see here that the lab animal eats somewhat more than a wild animal in the lab, about 20% more, but in fact eats no more than a wild animal in the wild. And this shouldn't be a surprise. A wild animal in the wild is running around, trying to find food, staying away from predators, thermoregulating, doing all sorts of things. But the sum total is that the wild mouse eats at least as much as the laboratory mouse, now it's doing a lot of different things with it, but in fact, if you look at a wild mouse that's in any kind of stressful environment, in fact, they eat considerably more. So the idea that this is simply gluttony, there is some gluttony in the laboratory mouse, but the idea that it's simply an effect of gluttony, I think is no longer tenable. So let me go through the, what I consider to be the prevailing orthodoxy and then try to address these points of the prevailing orthodoxies one at a time. One, that chronic DR extends life and ameliorates many aging phenotypes, and I don't think any of us will argue about that, at least in the laboratory. That it has this effect in virtually every animal species uh, and genotype investigated. That the key thing is in reducing total calories. It's not reducing protein or boosting carbohydrate or reducing uh, lipid intake, but it's, 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 it's really effect of reducing uh, calories. And finally, the point that I'm really going to harp on is, is this idea that DR is evolutionarily advantageous because it enhances survival during times of food intake. And this, I would say, if you ask almost anyone in the field, why does this dietary restriction effect exist? They would say, well, it helps animals survive through the bad times, and then they're ready to still be there and reproduce afterwards. So let's consider the first one. The first one about extending life and ameliorating many aging phenotypes is absolutely true for many, many uh, genotypes in the lab. But a problem for the idea that this is some evolutionary adaptation is that no one has ever shown that dietary restriction improves phenotypes relevant to life in the wild. In fact, the evidence, as I'll show you, is exactly the opposite. Now, it's difficult to do a field experiment where you reduce caloric intake, but you can do the opposite. You can actually supplement the food of animals in nature and if you do that, and you assume that they were somewhat restricted before, you might suggest that it actually, supplementing the food would increase reproduction but decrease survival. And as you can see, that really hardly ever happens. This is a survey of, of several dozen field studies, and in only two was there uh, any evidence that increasing food decreased survival in nature. But the key problem to me is that m many of the DR phenotypes seem maladaptive to animals uh, in the field. And I'm just going to go through some of these. The first thing is that DR, as everyone who's worked with it, enhances cold sensitivity. 
A lot of types of stresses restricted animals are more resistant to. Cold isn't one of them. The reason that's important is that some of the prime uh, uh, field mouse biologists uh, in the world have established quite clearly that over most of a mouse's natural range that the primary cause of death in the wild is the cold. So at least in this sense, it does not seem to be any kind of adaptive phenotype. Now, one of the things that, I, that, that when I was thinking about this initially that I thought might be a, a real advantage caloric restriction is if it could enhance sprint speed because particularly a, a, a burst of sprint speed is very important for an animal in the wild in which predation is a, is a substantial uh, source of mortality. Yeah. Yeah. That, I think, is extremely uh, species-specific, and I think that's a good point, because I'm, I'm going to talk about that. So make sure to use the microphone. Oh, be sure to use the microphone. Well, some, some can't, because they're not sitting where they are, but yes. Move the mic. If you're sitting near a microphone, use the microphone. If you're not, I don't know what you're going to do. So anyway, so we actually did some experiments where we did different levels of restriction, and we, and we simply asked how did it affect sprint speed. And so we did 10%, uh, 20%, uh, 30%, 40%. And you could see that as you started to get more and more restricted, it actually had a pretty major impact on the, on the sprint speed of animals. So if, this was the opposite direction uh, from which we, it, that we would expect if this were some sort of adaptive state in the wild. And here's the point that Ed was mentioning, that it slows wound healing. And there have been a number of studies of that. And absolutely agree with, with, with Masro. There's also been a number of studies that show if you then refeed the animals and then you wound them, uh, they, they tend to have a, a, a better immune response or healing response. But like I say, in the, in the wild, you don't get the opportunity to say, I'm going to get wounded in two weeks, so I better start eating. And finally, I think a thing that, that may be quite important is that some of the, it enhances the susceptibility to at least some sorts of infectious diseases. And there are numbers of studies on this now, and not only infectious diseases, but parasitic diseases. Um, uh, Debbie Christon, the postdoc that worked with me on this initially, subsequently <coughs> gone on to show that with certain nematode parasites, <coughs> dietary restriction, uh, they do much worse when they're uh, infected with nematode parasites. Uh, right here, Gabe Fernandez, a number of years ago, showed that if you simply poked the cecum and punctured the cecum, that the animals that were on dietary restriction survive less well. Elizabeth Gardner's lab has done several studies where they expose uh, dietary restricted mice to influenza, and they universally uh, do worse, whether they're young mice or whether they're old mice. The caveat I would say on that is she's only done it with uh, one genotype of mouse, which is C57 black 6 mouse, which we all know is a genotype that we really shouldn't use. Um, okay, and now, and now let me uh, go to what I think is really the critical thing. So what we think of as an old mouse is not just an old mouse, but a really old mouse. One of the questions that continually comes up is how long do animals live in nature? And so let me give you the one good data set on this. It was really uh, uh, accumulated by Sid Drickamer a number of years ago, who kept mice in an exclosure outside. So they had nest boxes. They had all their food and all their water supplied. And there was a fence around so that they couldn't leave, but also so that terrestrial predators at least couldn't get in, although aerial predators could. And over three years of data, almost 700 animals, this, this is what survival of mice in the wild looks like. And you can see that the average mouse, now this, this does not count sort of neonatal survival to be counted in this. You had to still be alive when you uh, appeared above ground from the nest, so you had to be weaned. Uh, that survival on average was about 12 weeks. 90% survival was about 
30 weeks, and the Jean Calment of uh, Maustum lived about 56 weeks. So what we think of is an old mouse is an old mouse, you know, squared, an old mouse quadrupled rel relative to uh, what mice live in nature. In fact, if I put that survival curve on the survival curve of a standard C57 black mouse, let's say in San Antonio, uh, this is what it looks like. Now, all of the health benefits associated with dietary restriction are out here. This doesn't make it, by the way, this doesn't make it any less interesting from a sort of medical perspective, but what it does is it puts its evolutionary impact, I think, in a certain perspective. So, These were done with wild mice. That's a good point. Yes, these were done with. Well, they weren't wild mice. They were wild mice that had been brought into the laboratory for a few generations and then reintroduced back. In. So they weren't black mice, for instance. Uh, the preservation of physiological function seen with DR may be irrelevant to mice in nature. Uh, chronic DR, uh, I think, is harmful for a range of phenotypes that would seem to be important for survival. Uh, so what is this DR effect all about? And, and before I reveal the answer, let me just go one other place, which is does dietary restriction extend the life in almost all species? And here is a smorgasbord of species in which dietary restriction has been shown to increase uh, longevity. Here is a smorgasbord of species in which dietary restriction does not extend longevity, and some of them, you'll notice, are the same species. <laughs> the reason they're the same species is it's genotype dependent. And this is something that nobody uh, wanted to believe for a long time, and in fact, a lot of people still don't believe, despite the fact that there's now lots and lots of evidence. But let me just give you one, what I think is probably the finest example of how dietary restriction does not extend lifespan. And this is a nice study by Jim Carrey on a medfly. And Jim Carrey spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to feed a medfly to establish what his ad lib food intake was, and also how he could precisely control the food intake of medflies. And this is the ad lib food intake here, and he started reducing it by 5%, oops, 10%, 15%, one of the things you'll notice here is there's no point in this restriction, either in males or females, where the life expectancy increases. You would expect, if, this were, if there were a dietary restriction, at some point this would go up before you started starving animals to death again, and in no place does it, does, does it do it. And it has variable effects, even in mice, and this is a paper I published a few years ago with Jim Harper and Chuck Leathers. And when I did this paper, when, when we were working on this, we, were, we followed the animals like this, and we said, aha, dietary restriction. This was a key thing. This was in wild-derived mice, mice that were three generations removed from the field. Thought, aha, we've demonstrated that dietary restriction has no impact on survival in mice. And then, oops, these guys continued to stay alive, and I tried to convince Jim to go into the lab and kill them on a weekend when nobody was looking, but I, I, I couldn't get him to do this. And the way we ended up interpreting this result is that these are gen genetically heterogeneous mice. They're mice that were collected out in nature, and it suggested to me that there was genetic variation for the DR effect, that these guys that were out here had particular genotypes that were favored under dietary restriction. These here that were dying earlier than the ad lib fed ones had a genotype in which it was uh, uh, unfavorable for dietary restriction. And uh, I got a lot of grief on that. And then uh, Jim Nelson came out uh, with this study looking at all these recombinant inbred strains and basically uh, that result fit the hypothesis for the interpretation of mine quite nicely. So I think it's quite clear, and, and, and everybody knows in flies, there are genotypes that do not live longer when you dietary restrict them. It's, I don't think anybody's done that in worms. It's certainly true in yeast as well. And what about monkeys? There was a famous study a couple of years ago now in uh, nature, or science, sorry, um, showing that if you Get rid of age, if you only look at what they called age-related mortality, 
after 20 years. This was a funny story because this study, 21 years old at the time, and when it came out, I got interviewed by the New York Times. What do you think about this? And I said they published prematurely, which didn't, <laughs> didn't make them too happy. But in order to get this result, they had to censor what they called non-age-related deaths, such as the animal that beat its head against the cage until it killed itself or something. So if you combine those, if you, if you combine all the deaths, there was, not a, there was not a significant difference. And for those of you who heard Julie Madison, who was here uh, last year, uh, it turns out that in the NIA study that's been going on for quite some time, they find lots of health benefits in the animals, but they don't find any vestige of an effect in survival. So I'd say the monkey story and the mouse story are kind of fitting together quite nicely at this point, which is that there are genotypes that are favorably uh, affected by CR and those that aren't. Okay, let's, let's go to an evolutionary view now. There are animals in the real world vary in their food availability, in the temporal pattern of their food availability, and they vary in their response to it. So some animals, when food gets scarce, they go into torpor, they hibernate. Some of them live in dung, and so they always have lots and lots of food. And there are species out there that specialize in dealing with food shortages. I think the best example is C. elegans, which has this whole special life phase that revolves around the response to low food. And in fact, if you go out and you capture worms in nature, you find out that almost all of them are in dour. That is, this is an inherent part of their biology. Dealing with food shortage is an inherent part of their biology, and their life history has multiple adaptations to dealing with that. This is true for many mammals. Some mammals deal with food shortages by going into hibernation or torpor. Some of them deal with it by storing food. But the key thing is that the one species that doesn't do any of these things, that has seemingly no special adaptations to any kind of prolonged food storage, is a house mouse. It, only is, it doesn't hibernate. It is only capable of a very short-term torpor. And so if that's the case, if dealing with food shortages by some sort of special adaptation is not something that mice do, what is the advantage? So let's think about the history of mice. For at least the last 10,000 years, house mice are called house mice for a reason. They hang out around houses. So they've been commensal with human. In fact, it's hard to find a self-sustaining um, field population of mice. Field populations of mice tend to occur uh, when there's lots and lots of food around but then if, if the people move away or something, they seem to be maintained by a constant recolonization from food. The primary food uh, source of these uh, mice for at least 10,000 years have been stored grain. So the hypothesis I'm going to put forward today and defend reasonably vigorously as, is that the uh, DR's key evolutionary benefit what it really evolved to do is to deal with a very short burst of acute food shortage. And this is, is just a, this is a fly paper, and I put it up here because uh, this was something that Linda Partridge's lab discovered a few years ago, which is that if you put a fly on food restriction, you get a, a, a very immediate drop in mortality. If you put it back on full feeding, you get a very quick increase in mortality. Now, this has been a kind of a controversial paper. I, I, I won't go into that, but it does raise the effect that there can be these acute effects. The other reason that I think there's something else going on is that even in the cases such as with our wild mice, in which we didn't get an extension in mean longevity, we still got a very robust anti-tumor effect of dietary restriction. And one of the things that doesn't get as much press as the extended lifespan is the way that DR protects against many, many, many toxins. The NCTR, the National Center for Toxicological Research, has tested them against many, many carcinogens. They have been tested against isoproteranol. 
They have been tested against antiviral drugs that have hematotoxic properties. They have been tested against mucosal injury. Time after time after time, in all of these challenges, the restricted mice do better than the control mice. And we could go on and on and on. So here's the hypothesis that starving animals are likely to eat items that they would normally avoid. If your lifespan in the wild is likely to be three to four months, you cannot afford to stop eating and start, stop reproducing for any length of time and wait for food to come back. What you're more likely to do is maintain your food intake but start eating things that you wouldn't normally eat. And things you nor wouldn't normally eat are things that are uh, uh, contaminated by fungus, by bacteria, et cetera. So for instance, stored grains, a big problem with stored grains are mycotoxins. And mycotoxins are known to be carcinogens, but acutely mycotoxins are cytotoxic. So uh, some examples of these, there are, uh, uh, no, uh, my favorite name of any, vo vomitotoxin. I, I wonder what that does. Um, this might be a special problem for mice. So my hypothesis is this is that dietary restriction acutely induces broad defense mechanisms against xenobiotics, that that's its evolutionary advantage is to allow animals to continue to eat robustly in times at which food is in short supply Normally edible food is in short supply, but food that may not be normally edible is, uh, uh, can be eaten. And that the enhanced protective mechanisms of dietary restriction under laboratory conditions extend life by multiple defense mechanisms. And the important part of this hypothesis, and the thing that I think was missed for most of the history of uh, dietary restriction, is that the protective benefits of DR could be cute, acute and not related to um, lifespan extension, but could have multiple uh, clinical points of significance. And I'm going to give you two examples that I think are extremely provocative. One is dietary restriction as an acute protectant against ischemic injury. And this is work that really uh, was pioneered by, by Jay Mitchell, who's been looking at the effect of very short-term dietary restriction on a number of surgical models of ischemia. I'm only going to talk about renal ischemia here, but he's done the same thing for hepatic ischemia. And what is he, he's done is he's induced ischemia by clamping off for a certain amount of time one renal pedestal and then releasing it, tracking what happens to the animals. Animals, uh, th these are black six mice, by the way, that uh, are ad lib fed prior to the surgery. Um, 90% of them die. If they've given a one-day fast before this happens, then 90% of them survive. And if they're given a two- or three-day fast or a longer period of dietary restriction, then none of them die. So here's an effect where acute, the acute protective effects of restriction are as dramatic as the chronic effects. Uh, another... Let me just mention before I move on that Jay has gone on to do this in a variety of mouse genotypes, some of which do not live longer, like BALB-C, which is a mouse genotype that does not live longer when it's caloric restricted. You still get the acute protection against ischemic injury, whether it's renal or hepatic. Another um, look at the same thing is Walter Longo, who Walter Longo had the idea that acute calorie restriction, that is short-term fasting, may be protective against uh, various chemo the, the side effects of various chemotherapeutic drugs. So he took a variety of mouse genotypes, this is three mouse genotypes. He gave he, he let the, he starved them for two days, put them on a water-only diet for two days and then expose them to really toxic doses. And the thing to look at here is just the, the column on the left, which is the survival. In every case, the ones on the short-term fast are the ones in red. And you can see that they survived better than the ones that were ad-lib fed. So a two-day fast prior to chemotherapy, serious chemotherapy in this mice, these are massive doses, this increased survival over ad-lib. Now, both of these things, I think, potentially have 
clinical significance. Um, Jay tries to downplay this, but if instead of not eating before, from midnight before one has surgery, if one doesn't eat for four or five days, or before one has a chemo, uh, is subjected to, to a chemotherapeutic regime, that, could, that would certainly be worth investigating. Now, uh, Walter uh, Longo has actually done a very small pilot study where he's looking at people undergoing uh, chemotherapeutic regimes. And th this is, this is a, like I said, it's a pilot, it's kind of crude. He basically has given them a, a questionnaire after their chemotherapeutic regimes, and some of these people are eating their normal diet, and some have fasted anywhere between three and seven days before their chemotherapeutic regime. And you can see that for the most part, the side effects that they're reported are uniformly uh, suppressed if they uh, underwent this acute dietary restriction. Let me just finish up here that chronic DR extends life and improves health in multiple species and genotypes. No question about that. Chronic DR doesn't do it all the time in all species and all types. An intriguing hypothesis, particularly to me since I came up with it, is that DR arose as a defense against xenobiotics during acute food shortage and that there could be health benefits to acute DR or its memetics that I think deserve some clinical inquiry. And I gave one of the places I gave this talk was Mayo Clinic uh, about a year ago, I guess. And they're actually doing, their surgery uh, group is actually uh, doing some pilot studies with this to see how uh, patients respond to it. So I give the whole credit to that, uh, to, to Jay Mitchell. So I think, I think that's it. Thank you very much.